see. I've got the card here I believe I'm supposed to read. Is that, is that right? That's right. It says, Dear church family, your prayers are needed now, and the beautiful quilt reminds me of how much you care. Please continue to pray with love. Joyce K. So that's, that's my sweet. Yes, I love it. Any, any first-time visitors? I know we have a person here that's visiting today that's been here before, but uh, Pastor Ted is going to handle that in just a little bit. All right. The Administrative Church Council will meet tomorrow night at 6.30. Uh, don't notice on the 21st there is a special offering it don't, on, that, on that Sunday. You can be thinking about that and uh, dig in your pockets, I guess, a little bit. The... Uh, 6 p.m. on Sunday, don't forget on the 21st, it's, they're having a gathering, but notice it's not right after church. I made that mistake one time when I first came here, and I, I, I came back right after church. We had to go around there and came back, and there wasn't anybody here. And I said, well, what, they, they didn't cancel the meeting. No, they didn't, and I went home, and I missed the meeting. So I mean, <laughs> it's at 6 p.m., not after church. Lucy Harrington Circle will meet on August the 5th at 6.30. All will know if that, and Sunday the 11th is going to be homecoming. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, all right, I've already covered that. That's it. Same thing for anybody else. All right. Um, good morning. Um, today is an interesting day in of of music in the church. Um, the message that Ted will bring, they'll be bringing to us, is powerful, and we have songs in our hymnal that address that but they are not for the most part familiar songs and but the words are so rich that they beg to be sung and so we will be doing that um if you'll go ahead and find your place at in christ there is no east or west and we'll be singing it to a different tune right here in the choir. <laughs> um, our hymn is number 548. If you will stand and sing to the tune of O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing, please.
Psalter. It's page 850, Psalm 133. This is one of my favorite psalms of just about people getting along with each other. And uh, so uh, you respond with the uh, bold print. Behold how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Amen. And uh, as often happens, we have a quilt. And uh, I think we are not only just going to have a quilt, we're going to have a testimony. Uh, there's some, a couple with us named Don and Carol Singwin. Singwin. And uh, I think they wanted to speak a word of appreciation. They had gotten a quilt at one time. They did. I, am I good? Yeah. Uh, they were here 11 months ago. We gave him a quilt. He's welc welcoming him back. He wants to give a little power of the quilt to talk to you about it. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just want to let you all know that, um, that prayer quilt was a real blessing. Uh, So anyway, uh, I just give you an update on uh, on my condition. Um, I went through about six weeks of radiation and five weeks of chemo every day for five five days a week. And uh, you know, the good Lord, He uses doctors. <laughs> and uh, medical uh, advances and everything, but all in all, when it comes to healing, it's Jesus. Yeah. So I had uh, I want immunization therapy right now for about a year, and it uh, what it is is uh, I go twice a month, and and it, um, it it builds up your immune system. In case any more cancer returns, because I, I had lung cancer, and uh, anyway, I had two CT scans and uh, a couple of X-rays, and um, they can't find any cancer. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you. It begins. We are not alone. And it's wonderful to know that people are with us in the midst of things. Uh, there's a quilt this morning, and it is for Peggy Johnson. Sponsor is Flo Douglas and Nita Calloway and others. And this is the sister-in-law of Margie Johnson, and Margie Johnson received a quilt last Sunday. Flo, do you want to give, like, a testimony of the need? Um, Peggy is the wife of Buddy Johnson, Willie Lee, some of y'all know them. Um, and um, Peggy will has been diagnosed with cancer and will be go undergoing, has already started her um, treatments, and so this is for Peggy. Also, I'd like to say that I ran in yesterday, our fabric friend at Hobby Lobby said, I need to tell you something. Um, Eddie Bridges was one of the first persons to ever get one of our quilts, and he was so sick then that there was no reason to think that he would be better. But he did get better, and he has, he has done okay. Um, but had been back in the hospital, and but she said, and the first thing I noticed was what? Yeah, that's well, quilt yeah. so, mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Peggy. Angela, you want? Angela's Peggy's good friend. Too. And uh, if you'll raise your hands toward and remember that after the service, uh, an opportunity to tie a knot in the quilt so you know what we do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, on a certain Sunday night, there's women that gather and they make quilts. Interestingly enough, uh, in my sermon today is going to be the power of quilts in a certain story. And, and so we thank you for... Uh, 
this being part of the encouragement, part of the healing. Uh, we know it is, and we thank you for those who do that. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to our time of prayer. We lift up our petitions, have a little time of silence. I will pray, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, my petition is Ruth Roach, as she continues the healing process. Uh, quite a lot of surgery. I, I'm, I'm not sure if Ruth is with us. Yeah. Oh, she is. Okay. Boy, <laughs> even with my glasses, even with the internet. Hallelujah. And so that's my petition for the continued. Let's take a little silence, and we'll pray. Lord, we come together on Sunday morning. It is the accumulation of everything that happened during the week. People who have had surgery, people who have had diagnoses, uh, some who passed away. Uh, Lord, your, your word says to weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laughed. I, I think this week there was some laughing going on and culinary camp and river of life. And, and uh, for those, Lord, who did that ministry, we give thanks. Uh, uh, hard work uh, being done and, and much leadership. We come out of that week of service for children and youth. We thank uh, Deborah and Flo who put together those meals for children. We thank Carol Brock and all those who helped with the meals for River of Life. We thank you for a church that is willing to reach out and willing to serve. On this day, we lift up the story of a Good Samaritan. We hear that story. We're reminded of the need to reach out and to help people in need. We're reminded that sometimes those who are expected to help don't help. We're reminded of those who are prejudged and looked down on, even often people who do the most good in this world. In those times when we're prejudiced, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits, raise our vision above the barriers of culture and color and creed that separate us. Give us love and wisdom in how we deal with each other. As we think about how we deal with people that are different, we pray for courage and determination for those who are oppressed. We pray for those who work for justice in the world. We pray that we would not isolate ourselves, but we would work for the good of the people around us. We commit ourselves to working for justice and goodness in the world. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We need a faith that causes us to know that when we open ourselves to people who are not like us, our lives become richer. We need a faith that causes us to see the eyes of God, to feel the warmth of God, to do the work of God, to live the peace of God.
offerings. Lord, today our theme is pretty much just people getting along with people. And uh, we come together in the church, and this is where we practice and love and compassion. Then move that compassion out. Help us to give with compassion on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, um, Pastor Ted already did what I what I was going to start with, but let's go back. If you were a part of culinary camp, and I mean a volunteer, you donated cans, you donated money, you participated, you were a volunteer leader, or you prayed for us, stand up. Okay. So... God bless this event, but you made it happen. And first of all, uh, a shout out to Flo. Give her a hand. I mean, many. I gotta, I gotta do it. She's looking at me like, nah, it's not my thing. Flo, Spent, and Deb, Chef Deb, and Sharon, many hours behind the scenes, just getting it together. And you don't know how much preparation was involved, but I know it was worth it in the end. Um, just the facts, real quick. Some numbers. These might not be exactly right, so you know you know the numbers. We had 19 participants, four chefs who were cooking, building relationships, learning about the Lord um, during that time. We had 21 to 25 volunteers, adults and youth, that came and volunteered, helping and doing everything. We cooked, prepared, and served others with 17 at least. They cooked 17 different dishes which seems unbelievable. That just also lends to the fact that the kitchen was organized most of the time. <laughs> and they were cooking. And, uh, you know, the things that they cooked also the first day that we made, part of it is learning to serve through food. So they did um, provide five baskets for shut-ins, which Ted delivered to our shut-ins of some awesome blueberry bread and all kinds of good things. So giving, giving them a hug through food. We um, we know that it was successful in a lot of ways, but but one thing that struck me and Flo and all of us is that not only uh, was it successful in our eyes, the kids came back every day. You know, they didn't come the first day and go, oh, I don't think that's my thing. They came back because they were having a good time. But also since then, we have received pictures of our at least three of our chefs in the grocery store with their parents. I mean, we had some that came from Evans, Georgia, where they were here visiting grandparents, that went straight to the grocery store and bought things to prepare this food and went straight home and were ready to cook. And we've gotten other pictures of chefs cooking the recipes that we did, which is awesome. And I hope that they'll continue to do that and, and share that with others. Um, during that time, we had also a shout-out to Patty Shreve because you can go on the website, and I encourage you to do that, she came diligently taking photos. She did a slideshow presentation, which was awesome, that we watched that night when the parents and family came to eat. Um, and we served 70 to 80 people that night on the Wednesday night, that food that the kids had prepared. But we enjoyed that. She also made certificates, and, and that just really wrapped things up nicely. So thank you, Patty. But go to the website, our, our Hopewell website, and you can click on the link and watch just a bunch of – there's a lot. Watch it. Watch it. They're, they're so cute. They're just awesome. Um, another part, it was international, which you already know. And really quickly, um, I'm probably taking too long. We did international. We did three countries, and the girls will share that in just a minute. I'm not going to do that. And they did some awesome things 
we also incorporate a little bit of art this year, which we had not done in the past. And so at the end of the day, we made an art project. Uh, we made a God's Eye Mexican art thing, which has a spiritual component to it. And then on the second day, we made a, a Chinese lantern, which, you know, has light in it. So it's kind of a light to the world. But um, there was so much going on, and it was an awesome week. <laughs> <laughs> the story is that I arrived last summer and one of the things was we got in a van and went to a choir practice so that we could do a sort of Fourth of July program. And I sat next to Carol Brock and I said, Carol, I got to tell you where I came from. We had a ministry called Family Promise. And I talked about Family Promise. She says, OK, now I'm going to tell you about River of Life. And she told me so she has she loves River of Life. And he was most kind not to tell you that he spoke about his mission for about five minutes and I spoke the other 45 all the way to Jackson and back. <laughs> if you want to know about River of Life, you ask me and I'll tell you. If I'm not able to tell you, there are 55 people out there that know about it. Hope Well has been partnering with First United Methodist Church since 1998. And we serve lunches to the workers. Now I'm giving a little detail because I know we've got at least three people in this congregation that didn't know about it until this year. We have workers that come from all over the state of Georgia. They're in the sixth grade and up group. If you finished your first year of college, you can be an adult leader. We build wheelchair ramps at no cost to the recipients. We do fundraisers throughout the year. We ask for money throughout the year, and we ask for food just before River of Life. We had over 275 sixth grade and up that came and was housed in GMC barracks Wednesday through last night. We fed them lunch every day, along with the other 60 volunteers that come with them. They have a worship service every night at the Goldstein Center. It's amazing how the lives of those workers are changed. They interact with the people for whom they build those wheelchair ramps. Some of them testified this morning that the homeowners told them had it not been for their new ramp, they would be a homebound person and unable to leave their home because of the condition of the ramp that they had or the stairs or the steps. They do an amazing job, but they're made to code. When they come in here for lunch, they're hot, they're hungry, they're silly. <laughs> this year was different. We packed out two-thirds of the over 300 lunches every day and delivered them to three specific sites around the county and Putnam County where we had other people from that church who received our group, served them, fed them, and clean up after them. Here at Hopewell, y'all have filled my cup again to overflowing. This ministry is dear to my heart. I want every one of you to experience the river. And for those kids out there, youth, when y'all get complete with the sixth grade, I want to take you to River of Life. And I'm not talking about like the river walk. It is a wonderful experience to you adults who have not been involved for whatever reason. Next year, about April, when I say I'm going to do River of Life, unlike Kay, we're not quite as organized. I'm going to let you sign up so I know who's coming. And when I need food, I'm going to tell you what I need. And if you want to donate it, you can, because someone overflowed me with potato chips this year. I asked for cookies and then, then found out at the last minute that one of the church ladies at the other church said they were going to fix their 75 cookies. So because of that, we have a table that's going to be out front and you're going to get a little bag of cookies to take back home. Thank you for baking. Thank you for praying. Thank you for putting $5 in my hand. Thank you for mopping. Thank you for cleaning. It was a little stress because there were seven people who are my right and left hand who were either on vacation part of the time, who were recovering from surgery part of the time, who had an illness of their own, could not be here. We had one new person, 
Lurleen West got initiated, and I hope now that your toes are wet, you'll get into your knees next time. Dick Shreve came and helped cook. That was his first time. And I just want you to know, if you need to know how many hours it takes to make coleslaw for 300 people, ask Smokyville. <laughs> if you want to know how long it takes to cut onions for seven gallons of salsa, ask Elsie Clark. They can answer those questions. And if you have any other questions, you find somebody and just ask them what it's about. Praise God for you people. Preparation is number 560, help us accept each other. And I just turned to the front of the hymnal that I'm using, and it's Ernest Yearwood's hymnal. But I can't think of anyone who more clearly reflected that in his life than Ernest did. Ernest loved everybody, and he even had a flower named for him called Everybody Loves Ernest. Right. Um, if you will stand and sing, I'm going to ask Becky to play um, the first verse for us, and if you'll read the words as you do, these, the words are rich in this hymn, and then we will sing the rest of the verses. Would you stand, please? scripture this morning that is very, very familiar. The story of the Good Samaritans comes from the 10th chapter of Luke, but we may look at a little different aspect than the normal sermon on this. So hear these words from the 10th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 30. Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Keep on talking about this, but Pat and I just a few weeks ago went to Tuscaloosa and I went to my 50th high school reunion. I am very old. And uh, we spent two evenings doing uh, the reunion things, 
But during the day, I tried to look up former friends, and I went to lunch with we Pat and I with a lady named Nancy Callahan. And if that name sounds a little familiar, she has been on our prayer list. She is now struggling with breast cancer. And uh, just to tell you about uh, my experience with Nancy, Nancy and I, back in the day, played in a jazz trio that played in places around Tuscaloosa. She was the pianist, and I was the drummer. But her big thing was not so much jazz piano as it was writing. She wrote magazine articles. She was the ghost writer for David Matthews when he was president of the University of Alabama wrote wonderful things, and so uh, it was back quite many years ago in the civil rights era, and there was a big demonstration in Selma, Alabama, and Nancy is always looking for a story and always looking for a book, so she traveled to Selma, and she began to talk to some of the civil rights workers there. What they told her was that they wanted to set up a college fund for some of the young people there in Selma who could not afford to go to college. And in this black community, there were women who created beautiful quilts. And uh, they, the, the, the civil rights workers actually took the quilts to Macy's and Bloomingdale's in New York and sold them and created a college fund for youth there in Selma. Uh, Nancy wrote the book. The book was called Freedom Quilting Bee, and it was the book that she wrote that made the New York Times bestseller list. So that was an amazing thing. So we ate lunch with Nancy, and uh, she is somewhat incapacitated, but she is still writing. And I said, so what are you working on now? And here is the latest book that she's working on. Uh, I, I thought all of the civil rights incidents and demonstrations were in the 60s. It, it went beyond that. And so there was something that happened in a, a place called Choctaw County, Alabama in the 70s. The story was there were some things that needed to be righted. There were some people that demonstrated. In the midst of that demonstration, a white supremacist plowed through the demonstration, hit a 19-year-old black girl, and she was taken to the hospital. When the hospital found out that she was involved in the demonstration, they refused to treat her, and she died. There are things that we have done. I know we're in a new era, but things that are, are grievous, things that are bad. Uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about my own journey uh, I have struggled sometimes with feelings that I shouldn't have. And, uh, you know, sometimes little things will help you th see things more clearly. I am the father of a child of divorce, and I would make those trips over to Alabama, pick up my son, Chris, and I'd say, is there anything that you want to go do and see? And one year, Chris said, you know, Dad, they have a civil rights museum in Birmingham. Let's go see that. And so my son and I went, and we went into this darkened auditorium, sat on some bleachers. All of a sudden, the lights came on. There was a wall, and all you saw was two drinking fountains. And uh, one of them was uh, uh, stainless steel and modern, and it said white above there. And you looked over, and there was one that was ceramic and cracked, and it said colored. And it was a reminder that we treated people differently. Uh, Chris and I went through that museum. We saw exhibits. We saw Rosa Parks uh, uh, talk, telling the story about a lady who refused to ride in the back of a bus. We saw a burned out bus that represented the freedom riders. And uh, something that was close to my heart because it was close to my home a video and, and representation of George Wallace standing in the door of Foster Auditorium attempting to, black, to, to block a black student from enrolling. Now, the reason that meant a lot to me, I only lived about two blocks away from Foster Auditorium, and so it was something. So Chris and I are walking through this museum, 
And Chris looks at me and he said, Dad, why are you crying? And, and I, I, I wasn't one of the people that had been oppressed, but to think that uh, I had not maybe spoken and done and that maybe there were things that I could have done to bring right relationship about. We're going to read a story today. We read a story that we've read a lot of times. And normally we read the story, the, the emphasis is that uh, we don't always do what we're supposed to do. We don't always reach out and help in the way that we're supposed to help. We're going to look at it a little bit differently. You know, we're going to talk about some people called Samaritans. And if you were a Jewish person, a Samaritan was somebody you didn't want to have anything to do with. Samaritans were a mixed breed of people. They did have some of the blood from Samaria. They also had some Jewish blood. And because they were a mixed breed, uh, they were disliked by the Jews. Uh, they didn't worship the same way as the Jewish people. They worshiped on a mountain. The Jewish people worshiped in the temple. And uh, there were some, some uh, uh, battles between the uh, Jews and the Samaritans. If you remember the book of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah went back to rebuild the city walls of Jerusalem, and it was the Samaritans that stopped them or tried to stop them from doing that. So what do you think the disciples thought in the fourth chapter of John? You remember the story is Jesus, and he's ministering to a Samaritan woman at the well. You know, as you read the story, uh, they wondered why Jesus even went to Samaria. Most people would have taken the long route and avoided it, but he actually went into Samaria. He saw a woman at the well. He did what no good Jewish man would have done. You know, if you're a good Jewish man, you're not supposed to talk to a woman. You're especially not supposed to talk to a woman from Samaria. And, and it wasn't just some little passing conversation. He asked her for a drink of water, and it opened up a discussion. And he talked to her about what it meant to be saved. And it must have taken, because you remember the story, she went from that place and kept telling people, I've met the Messiah. He made a lasting impression. So we come to the story we read today. And it's the story of the Good Samaritans. And if Jesus was telling this story to Jewish people, when he said the word good, they would have winched. What? Good? How would you call a Samaritan good? And uh, so imagine, even as he's telling the story, there are people who are angry. Now, we didn't go back up this far, but the story starts because there's a lawyer asking a question. I think sometimes good things don't happen when lawyers ask questions. And so the lawyer was asking, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus began to talk about the commandments. And he said, love your Lord, your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, this man said, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells a story. He sets up this very plausible situation. I went a few weeks back to a uh, workshop about the Holy Land and saw pictures. And they described the route between Jerusalem and Jericho. It's very, very dangerous. People would get mugged and robbed all the time. And so, sure enough, there's a man coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, going down that road. The worst thing happens he gets beat up, he gets robbed, and that's the beginning of the story. We start looking for a hero. We start looking for somebody who is going to help in this situation. So the first person is a Levite. Now, a Levite was somebody that worked in the temple, somebody who knew religious law better than anybody, and as Jesus is telling the story, they're going, yeah, Levite's going to do it. And Levite pats up passes over to the other side of the road. Doesn't do anything. Next person coming down is a priest. That's not us clergy. We have to be the kindest, most compassionate people, not all the time. And this priest maybe had something on his mind, and the priest goes over to the other side. Finally, 
the person who comes is a Samaritan. Now, if this had been a movie in a theater, in, in, in a Jewish theater, you would have heard boo, hiss. Samaritan, what's he doing in the story? And the Samaritan does what the other two men should have done. He stops, he goes over, he binds up the wounds of this man, he takes him to an inn, he says, look, here's some money, but I'm going to come back, give him whatever he needs. He does what he's supposed to do. Jesus asked the question, which one of these men was his neighbor? And you had to answer, it was the Samaritan. And Jesus replied with all, all he could say, then go and do likewise. We like to categorize people. We like to say, well, if you're this kind of person, you're going to be good and moral and compassionate. But if you're this other kind of person, you're probably not a very good person. We sometimes prejudge people. We can make up our minds about people by the way they dress, by the accent they have, by the part of the country they came from, and by the color of their skin. Now, we're going to go uh, actually uh, Monday to North Carolina and visit Pat's daughter, Allison. And i got to tell you a little bit about Allison. Allison is the wife. He is now retired, but Juan was in the Marines for 23 years. They moved all over the country. Uh, Allison was her own United Nations. Wherever she would go, she would get friends from every nationality, every color, every creed. Uh, Allison just collected different kind of people. We went to North Carolina for Thanksgiving one year. And uh, yes, we did have turkey and dressing, but at the Thanksgiving dinner, uh, there was a couple from, uh, where was it, not Palestine? <laughs> Pat's not listening. Well, th 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 there was a couple from the Philippines. <laughs> uh, you you got to help me, from the Philippines. And, uh, and there was a lady from Vietnam. So on that Thanksgiving, we had Philippine food and we had uh, Vietnamese food. And, and so Allison is wonderful at collecting people and loving people. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes we just want to surround ourselves with people that are just like us. And we don't mean to, but I think we do. Once upon a time, I was the manager of a piano store in Augusta, I mean in Atlanta. And uh, it was my job to pick the people that would man the store. It was only three other people. And uh, I thought I was doing a fair job of picking. And uh, when, once I got the staff in place, every one of them had a background in church music. I wanted people that were just like me. And, and so the fallacy is that we do that. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, misinterpretations of the Bible. Uh, you know, there's, there's people that preach and they say, go to the ninth chapter of Genesis. And it's the story of Noah. And Noah gets drunk and Noah gets naked. And his son Ham uncovers his father's nakedness and drunkenness. And out of that, there came a whole new race. That is not right. Uh, the story is that uh, Ham, uh, God didn't pronounce a curse. Noah did. Noah pronounced a curse on Ham. Ham was one of the Canaanites. And they were white people. And so we have wrong interpretations in the Bible. There were times when God would say, don't mix with people only because the Jewish people were passing through lands that worship pagan gods and he didn't want to be influenced. For the most part, the Bible talks about scripture that says we are to unite with one another. In the creation story of Genesis, God created us in his image. It doesn't say some of us in his image. It says he created all of us in his image. Paul was preaching to the people of Athens in the 13th, 17th chapter of Acts. Verse 26 says, And he made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. We're going to sing a song a little later. We usually sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
but instead we're going to sing all people that on earth do dwell sing to the lord with cheerful voice you know i have this image that jesus uh, that heaven is going to be the greatest diversity that we've ever experienced i can imagine going to heaven and i think about the music and i think from one corner of heaven is going to be high church and a big choir and robes and a pipe organ and that really you know exciting kind of music i think in another corner of heaven there's going to be gospel music and people dancing and uh, doing all kind of things i think in another part of heaven there's going to be rhythm and blues and it doesn't just touch our souls it touches god's soul as well isn't it something when we get the chance to worship with different kind of people i'm going to mention tuscaloosa again i'm sorry and uh Living there, my dad was minister of music at Trinity Methodist, and one of the great things, on Thanksgiving Eve, we had a service with three churches. If you know Tuscaloosa, it's now called Paul Bear Bryant Road. It used to be called 10th Avenue. And right here is Trinity Methodist. Go a little further is Calvary Baptist. Go a little further is Temple Emmanuel. And those three churches would get together on Thanksgiving Eve and worship together. And I don't know why, but as a little kid, I thought, man, this is the way it ought to be. People of different faith traditions who actually work to worship together. I want to end with a vision of heaven. If you go to the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, you see all these people gathered around the throne and they're saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they're singing, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. You created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And then it's, we sing, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You know, we don't repeat the Apostles' Creed as much as we maybe should, but it talks about the Holy Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. And what that means is the universal church a church where we're bound together not by how we worship, by the fact that we were all saved through the sacrifice and through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Please remember to pray over and tie a knot in the quilt today before you leave. It's out on the side. Also, um, Pat and Ted will be gone for the next two Sundays, and so be sure that you remember them each day. Um, for travel mercies and to have a good time without us but do come back um our hymn is number 75 we'll sing the first and the last uh, first and second verses and remember that the tune is the tune to the doxology would you stand <laughs> Lord, if there was uh, one sentence, one line that may have been the entire service, it's help us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Uh, give us hearts open. Uh, help us with whatever prejudice may remain within us. Uh, teach us to love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.